Welcome back to Real Girl Talk Podcast Radio. I am your host, Sherry Ricard. I'm bringing you weekly interviews with fascinating guests with action-packed episodes, highly relatable stories that help women reboot, regroup, and reinvent themselves in family, community, lifestyle, and business. And of course, always committed to keeping it real. Now let's dive in. The loss of a loved one is a nearly universal emotional crisis. Unprocessed grief and painful feelings can be buried, leaving you to feel numb. But there is hope. Certified grief counselor, RN, and author Sherry Ricard shares her story of how to cope in her first book, Wake Up Call, A Mother's Grief Journey, after the loss of her 17-year-old son. This book, along with Sherry's other books, are available on Amazon as well as on SherryRicard.com. Hey guys, welcome back to Real Girl Talk. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate you guys so much. I have a guest on my show that is an expert, expert, expert in her field. And I'm going to ask her a lot of questions because I really just want to know the answers myself. But Kelly Glover is the founder of The Talent Squad. She specializes in booking podcast interviews for entrepreneurs, authors, and experts. She has an 18-year track record working in the media and started podcasting in 2007. She has hosted her own syndicated radio show, has worked as a talent agent, celebrity interviewer, and produced award-winning podcasts as a, at a network level. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you very much, Sherry. I'm so excited to be here and talk to you all about podcast guesting. Uh, would y'all just listen? Listen to her accent. It's so very cool. I love that. So we're going to change the pace and have an Australian with us today. Yeah, but I love your accent. That's the first thing that I said. Okay, I was like, you know freaking what? out. It's so what, lovely. What does everybody say I have an accent? I was talking to someone the other day and he started cracking up laughing because he said, I can tell that you're from the South. And I don't think I have an accent. And I know everybody listening is probably laughing right now because they're probably agreeing with you. I don't, I don't hear it, but I guess I do. Yeah. Well, that's why I love podcasting because you can read a blog post and look at a photo, but you can't get the personality from that. How fun yeah. speaks or their excitement or how relaxed and chilled they are. So this is why I love audio so I much. I know. I know. I want to, I want to talk to you about so much, actually. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the podcasting and how you came to help other podcasters. But I want to go back to 2007 because podcasting was not such a big deal then as it is now. Now it's like, everybody has a podcast show. I feel like I know that's not true, but it has exploded since 2007. So what got you into podcasting back then? So I've been in media and entertainment for 18 years. And when I got into podcasting, I was in community radio. Podcasting was just coming in and um, it was the radio show and we took out the music and we took out the commercials. That's what a podcast was. Um, I ended up going to the Australian Film, Television and Radio School, which is the national broadcasting school in Australia. They only picked 10 people. So from there we learned podcasting. But even then it was, it was so complicated. And now you can get a podcast up and running in a day, click and drag a file, and it's so easy. So the evolution in those 12 years have been amazing, but I feel like it's accelerated like 10x in the last two years. And um, we were at the same, we were at podcast movement together yes. we didn't even meet each other but you said you saw me running around so I did I did I, I, I do I do recognize you because I know when your assistant sent over some information on you and I looked at your picture and I thought oh my gosh I mean heck yeah I'm gonna have her on my show because I remember seeing you and you have a really great reputation in helping podcasters and I didn't even know that you work with authors and and celebrities and podcasters and all of these different, all these different people. And you're so right because now over the last few years, it has actually exploded. And I did not set out to do a podcast myself at all. I mean, I, and I'll tell you something really crazy, Kelly, though, you know, I'm into vision boards and everybody that knows me knows that I am in to vision boards and I have an event. My second annual create your life vision board workshop is going to be this January. Everybody knows that 
It sold out last year. And I love to share my knowledge of vision boards. But on my board last year, before I ever did podcasting, I took a little logo and it said, I Heart Radio. <gasps> yes. Yes. So I, don't, I don't know why. I, I honestly tell you, I do not know what triggered me into putting that logo on my vision board, but I put that on there and I also put a microphone on my vision board because I, but the microphone was because I did a lot of speaking. But what I didn't realize is the microphone was sitting right on top of the iHeartRadio logo not realizing a year from then I would actually be on iHeartRadio. So it's crazy. Okay. So for, for next year, for 2020 vision board, you need to put that with the iHeart studios. Cause let me tell you, I've been there in New York in person. They're amazing. And then like, we'll see if we can get you into the iHeart studios. So put that on the vision board for next year. Look, I just wrote level. it down. Upper level, Sherry. Great. I'm I just in. wrote it down because I'm going to manifest that into my life. I am a true manifester. I am. I, yes, that's it. It's in my life. It's going on my vision board and, and I'm holding you to it, Kelly. How would somebody know if they have the talent to even podcast? I think, I think you need to, the first thing you need to do is have like, ask yourself the questions and it's who do I want to reach? What action do I want them to take? And what is the end result of me doing this podcast? Because that is going to tell you if it's a business project, if it's a personal project, what kind of project it is. Now, if you're just doing a small one and you don't need any results and you're just doing it for the fun of it, that is absolutely fine and go ahead and do that. If you're doing it for other reasons, you need to have those end goals in mind so you can figure out if you're getting there and write the roadmap of how to get there, Step, do the steps, do the plan, all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. also the first thing is I think people think, okay, I'm doing a podcast. I need to do one episode a week. That's 52 episodes a year. And then it becomes this never ending thing. And there's something called pod fade where people get so excited at the beginning and then they burn out after, you know, 12 episodes because they're like, wow, this is work. There's so many moving paths. This is a job into it unto itself. Right. But you don't like, if you want to do that and that like, um, that's great. If you don't make it a season, make it an eight episode season. And you might do that twice a year. You can also batch. So think from the beginning of the plan for it to be a long-term play so you're able to manage it and keep it going instead of burning out super early. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't know that I would not have not done the seasons had I even realized that you could do that. So when yeah, people don't know it's a possibility, you're totally they right. don't know it's a possibility. Think about it upfront and you can always change it. I just right. think people get shackled to this idea of never ending and it becomes a chore. And honestly, podcasting should be the funnest part of your week. It really is for me. I, it is for me. Like we're both talkers. I was on, I was in commercial radio. I had a radio show. I talked for six hours a day. So I'm fine with doing it never ending for once a week. That's great for me, but it's not for everybody. Right. And I think, people think I'm an introvert. I don't want to do, that's too much for me. No, it's not. It's absolutely because it's one-on-one -on -one. right now. We're sitting, I'm in Los Angeles because I'm going to a work at conference. You're at your place. We're at home. We are talking one-on-one -on -one to each other. That is achievable for people. There's no one looking at me in the audience for 5,000, 1,000, 2,000 people. It's just me and you. So right. introverts can do podcasts as well. It's a great way for networking. It's a great way to reach your audience. It's, there's so many benefits to podcasting. And if you don't want to do a podcast yourself, be a podcast guest. Go on other people's shows and reach their audience and maybe try that first before you decide to launch your own show. Like there's a lot of ways into this. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. I will tell you that even when I was asked to be a guest on a few podcast shows and I was on a, a couple of radio syndicated radio shows, I was asked as an author. So when my books launched, you know, I was asked a few times to be on radio shows and podcast and, and I didn't accept all the invitations, but I did accept quite a few. But even then I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about podcasting when I was challenged. I will say I was challenged because I was um, at the summer of last year to do a Facebook live and six Facebook lives is what I did every Wednesday. I went on live and had something to share. And most of the time it was something from my book. It was maybe on, you know, confidence building or whatever chapter that I decided to, to share that turned into the podcast. And it was because to be able to go live 
every Wednesday evening on Facebook, you know, the lights and the hair and the makeup and all was not an easy task. And with podcasting, I knew that I could sit down and have an interview in my pajamas and my unicorn slippers, and I could still give the same message without having to do all the lights, camera, action. And it just turned into a love of mine. I absolutely love it. I've met the most amazing people because my guest, if I'm not in person, like I was with Reagan Charleston this week in New Orleans, you know, that podcast was live. It was amazing. But I, we just like Kelly and I right now, we're talking to each other, but we see each other. We're on a web call. It's just like if we're sitting down and having coffee, but I'm in Louisiana and she's in California. And it's, it's amazing because I believe that anyone that has anything to share, a talent or a skill, can be a guest on a show. Spoiler alert, um, I have seen the unicorn slippers. I got to see them today. So <laughs> right now, you can envisage Sherry wearing those unicorn slippers. Yes, so, I have my unicorn slippers on and I'm proud of them. They make me happy. Um, and yeah, so really, it's we, we at the Talent Squad, we say it's the speaker gig you can do without leaving the house. Like we were saying, you don't have to get the Uber to the airport. Then you don't have to go through security. I was at JFK yesterday. It took me 90 minutes to get from curbside to the gate. Unbelievable. Then you have to get on the plane for five hours. Then the Uber to the hotel. Then you've got to stay at the hotel. Go to the, like, There's a lot to that. You're away from your family plus meals. But podcasts, you set it up and you do the interview and that's 30 to 60 minutes and that's on demand. In, when you go to a conference, it's the people in, that happen to be in the room at that moment. Like let's say it's 500 people, great. But with a podcast, it's like having that talk on tap 24 hours a day that anyone can come listen to in three years' time. It's wow. amazing. Now, what do you do? Let's talk about the talent squad because what do you do for, say, someone, not necessarily that wants to get into podcasting, but what, do, what can you do for an author? Because, you know, I teach an online course that I have called Writer's Roadmap that's actually going to launch in a few weeks. So these are going to be new authors that want to get out there and want to be able to market and share their new books, what would you do for that person? So first of all, I, you need to know, okay, what's the launch date? And then you need to reverse engineer because in podcasting, as you would know, we're recording this interview right now, but it might not go out for a few weeks. So there's a bigger lag time than say on television, in magazines and online. And every show is an independent publisher. So their release schedule is different. So I would say start getting on podcasts way before your book launches because and then you can negotiate not even negotiate that's not true you can request saying look my book's coming out in february um would is it possible to maybe release around that time and then it's up to the host discretion whether they will or won't do that but i say get on the train early and even before your book is published because if you're going on shows you're really going on there to sell to promote your book we all get that but if you go on a show before your book even comes out you get the no like and trust factor audiences like you and then they're more likely to want to get your book when they've already met you so you can then go back to the show for a second bite at the cherry and be like hey we're on last time now i've got this book coming out can i come on again so right. podcasting guesting isn't a one-time thing it's a repeatable thing that you can do and go back on a show as a guest um but as far as authors getting ready for a launch you really need to be ready with your messaging first so people don't if i want i've got a book i want to come on a podcast as a producer, as a host yourself, Sherry, you'd be like, so what? Who cares? Right. So it's really about the content of the book and what that's going to do for the audience. So you need to think about the show and the audience before you think about you and your book and what you're promoting. Right. So the, it's about you being an expert, the expert that wrote the book rather than the book itself. So what's your messaging? You need to distill that core messaging. You need to get your talking points. Um, you need to have your one sheet ready. You need to have your media vault ready. And that's before you even pitch. Then you've got to find shows to pitch. And if you think about how, like an app, podcasting is competitive. If Even if a show does do 52 shows a year, I hear of shows getting pitched up to 50 times a day. So I did a calculation on that. That's 18,000 pitches they're getting a year. So you have to be one of 52 in those 18,000, even, even if it's, less it's still competitive so you need to really it's not just sending an email hey can i be on your show you need to research the show so before coming on sherry's show like i know that you've got kids in there that they're 18 i know about that course i know right. about that book i've gone through and i know all these things about you because i'm truly interested in you so right. as an author going on a show 
yes, you're reaching the target audience and people that you want to get into your ecosystem, but there's also the host that you want to have a relationship with. So they can sometimes be your ideal client as well or ideal reader or maybe a partnership or affiliates. So think of podcasting, like whatever you think of podcasting, 10 exit and think of all the different avenues that you can use because it's such an amazing tool. You know what? I love that, Kelly, because you can use that, not just an author, but I'm sitting here and, and, and I'm thinking, what a great avenue and marketing tool this would be to get the word out, no matter what business you're in. There's so many different online businesses. So we have, you know, everybody wants to be a coach this, these days. And that's just a pet peeve of mine because I don't believe that everyone can be a coach. I think that you have to have the experience. You have to have the success. You have to have the education on the research and the knowledge background. You can't just read a book and then go coach someone on it, right? But we do have a lot of coaches now. We have a lot of people that are in uh, network marketing, multi-level marketing, and they're selling great things. I mean, they have really good products. Why would they want to do the same thing and pitch themselves on a particular show if they have something great to share? Yeah, so podcasting, being a guest on podcast is about reaching niche audiences. Instead of going for the Tim Ferriss, which everyone always comes to me and says, hey, I want to be on Tim Ferriss. Well, you're an accountant and you want to talk to dentists. You need to go on dental podcasts because that's where all the dentists are listening. So go the niche, the more niche, the better because those audiences are loyal to the host and they're highly curated and they're hugely um, interactive. That's where you want to be. The other part of the, the element is the interview training. So just because I can run a 5K doesn't mean you're great at interviews. You still need to practice. So at the Talent Squad, we say winging it is a waste. So you've got, your, you've got your book, you've got your messaging, you've pitched, you've got on the show. If you don't prepare for that interview, you've wasted it and it's just been a nice chat. So you need to get your key messaging in there. You need to make sure you hit all your talking points. You need to mention the book, but not too many times. And I won't name the podcast because I really think the guy is great and he's very knowledgeable. But his podcast is wonderful, but he says no less than 15 times he refers back to his book. Yeah, and that's too many. That's too many. It's, it's ridiculous. Like I get to the point and I'm like, okay, dude, we get it. You have a book and I know we can find the information in the book, but right now I'm listening to the podcast to get golden nuggets. Please don't tell me you have a book again. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I understand that. And the way that I think of it is this is a first date. Do not ask me to marry you on the first date. It ain't happening. Right. Like I just want to get to know you and people will like you or they won't. And if they like you, they'll want to find more out about you. And they'll be able to tell that. And if they don't, that's good too, because we've, you know, we've exed each other out of the dating pool and move on to something that you'll like more. To get that messaging, you need to get the pitching right. And then you need to get the interview training. And then there's after that, it doesn't end with the interview either, Sherry. Like you need to do work after the interview. So you need to promote that. You can then turn that into your own content. Um, if you can get the transcript, if not, you can create your own transcript. And then you can pull out quotes from that and put it on Instagram. So it really, it really is the gift that keeps on giving that you can use for other things. And then you can get quotes from that and put it in your next book. So, right. Yeah. Those are really good. There's that's, a lot of things. Yeah. That's really good. And I know that. So is this what you do for someone? Because I'm sitting back and I'm thinking that, you know, when I started my podcast, I will tell you, I had no knowledge whatsoever. And everyone that's in podcasting knows who Pat Flynn is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so I see Pat Flynn on social media and he's talking about starting your podcast and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to start with this guy and see where it goes. I got on one of his free webinars, learned information from his free webinar, took that information, went on YouTube, gathered more information. It took me several months, several months gathered all the information that I needed. I talked to a few people that were already had their own podcast only because I reached out to them through social media. And I said, Hey, Liz, I listened to your podcast. I'm wanting to start my own podcast. I know you're super busy, but what kind of microphone do you use? You sound wonderful on air or, you know, what type of software do you use? Because it flows really easily. And you'll be, I was really shocked and excited at every person that reached back to me and said, congratulations, good luck on your show. I use, you know, ABC mic. And I thought, awesome, you know, and I would write it down. And so I will tell you, I gathered so much information that I wished at the time 
I had have ha I could have found someone that I trusted and knew that had my best interest at heart that I could have reached out to and said, help me. Yeah. yeah so there's so many things in what you've just said. First of all, there's a group called She Podcasts. That is a great place of women helping women um, and lots of resources. And it's funny that you said that because in, I have a Facebook group, um, the Talent Squad. Feel free to join. It's all about interviews, um, getting guests and everything that I've spoken about. And today uh, we were running a slightly late on the interview and I said I did a um, quick video in that 10 minutes. Yeah. And that was about, I just ran through and said, hey guys, I'm use, this is the mic set I'm using when I'm travel, right? So yep. yeah, this is an ATR 2100. You can get them anywhere. I have that one too. A Blue Yeti. Yes, but, I have um, that too. So that's a good one as well for a starting mic. And then my mic stand, 20 bucks. My windsock, $3. And um, yeah, so anyone can get set up for a reasonable price. There's lots of resources. Pat Flynn's a great one. But I feel like if you want to get started being a podcast guest or a podcaster, you, um, Sherry, it sounds like you went through a longer period I of did. time in the learning curve, but now that's express because right. there's so many people giving so much good information. Right. Um, right. And then with regards to being on interviews and doing it the right way, there's a lot of other things to consider. So, and you said this as well, you like, like you can, it's got to be positive and negatives. You can't just be one side and say all the positive stuffs all the time because that's unrealistic and no one's going to believe you. So of that's course. The strategy of in interviews and the way that you speak, you need to consider that. So I speak probably faster than I should because I get really excited about what I'm talking about, but there's techniques that you can use. Like if people are not on your side, then you need to speak faster. If people are already on your side in a captive audience, speak slower because they want to catch on to your ideas. So there's all these different things. Again, we say, yeah, I can talk, I can go on a podcast, but if you want to be a really good guest, then there's all these other techniques that you can use within um, and even just using keywords. So right. because you have show notes and transcripts and people are putting podcasts on YouTube now. So if you want someone to look up podcast guest booking agency, you kind of have to intertwine that in the interview in the least right. creepy salesy way possible. Um, but you know, you've got to be smart because this is a business play for a lot of people and you need the results on the other side. So those right. are just two ways to do that. Right. And, and I, I get that. And I, I can see where you've been in this business for so long and you have so much knowledge that I could probably talk to you for a thousand hours, but <laughs> I, I, I could, I, I mean, you're just, you're so, you're so full of all these golden nuggets, not just for people that want to do a podcast, but people that have something to share, whether you're an author or you're creating online courses and you have, you know, the, a networking business or, you know, multi-level marketing, whatever it is that you're doing on the side, you could be working full time and you could have this on the side. You can still be on someone's podcast. I had someone come to me and tell me, she said, you know, I want to be on your podcast so bad. I actually sought her out. And I will tell you, I have so many people that pitch me now. I'm amazed. Like, because I'm thinking, oh my God, the people that want to come on my show is so exciting. But I actually sought after a particular girl to be on my show and she works full time. And so I adjusted my schedule because I wanted her that bad on my show. Okay. Let's talk about this, Sherry. So tell us about people pitching you. How frequently do you get pitched? Is it PR agencies? Is it booking agencies? Is it people themselves? What do you like? What do you dislike? And what, what do people send you? And what do you make your decision on? Yeah, that's interesting that you say that, Kelly, because I absolutely do not have a lot of interest in anyone that pitches me that does not know anything about me. When, when, you're, when you pitch me and it looks very generic, and it looks like you copied and pasted it to several podcast hosts, I can see straight through that. And I'll tell you, I have a variety. I have people that pitch me directly. I've had celebrity agents, their own PRs uh, and agents approach me and email me and pitch me as well. And it's very short and sweet and they're celebrities. And you know, a lot of them that of course that have all been on my show, people know them if they watch those particular networks. And so their pitches are not just, they don't really know me a whole lot, but it has been from people being on my show and then they will talk about my show to their friends, their CEO, business owners, celebrities, whoever they are. And then I've had, I've actually had celebrities approach me and say, can I be on your show? I had a celebrity stylist that approached me out of LA 
loved her, but she heard of me through someone else that was on a television show and she wanted to be on my show. So it's just kind of progressed that way. But the thing that turns me off completely is when it looks like it's been copied and pasted and you don't know who I am, you've never listened to my show and you're just pitching because you want your client or yourself to be on there and you really don't have anything valuable to share. Yeah. And that's what we were saying before is you need to know who the audience is, what they want to learn and what can you give them. It's about giving first. And something that I like to say is vague, vague flattery will not get you pitched. Those generic ones, I've seen them. I've seen people say, hey, copy and paste this, send this. Never do that. Please don't do that because the hosts are smart. They will see through it. Right. And hi, insert host name. I listened to insert episode and it was really great. And no one's buying that. You actually need to have listened. Yeah, everything that you've said. Right. Yes, but there's also techniques and ways to, like the pitch is really important. You have one chance, even just getting the subject line right. People will not open it if your subject line isn't right and that needs to be right. So you need to have your messaging in place. So everything is a step by step by step to have ready. And um, I know a lot of people say, oh, just, just get started, just send it out. That's not right in pitching and media relations and media outreach because if you waste that one chance on not being ready and having your ducks in a row, you won't get the yes. You'll be on the blacklist and you won't, you, you wasted that chance. So you right. really do need to be ready in this case. I totally agree with you. And I will add there too, that if you are pitching yourself to a podcast or a syndicated radio show or whatever it is, and you don't get a response back, allow a little bit of time and it's and follow up because people are busy and they're being very productive and they're recording their shows or they have other things that they do. You know, I'm personally, everyone knows that I work in the corporate world as well as I have a podcast show and I write books and I do speaking events and I travel quite a bit. And just because I don't answer that email doesn't mean that I don't want you on the show. It may mean I haven't had a chance to answer that email, you know, but eventually I'm going to answer it and tell you, yes, I would love to, or I can't do it right now. Can you message me back in January of 2020 or something like that? Okay. So the secret to that is um, if you do get the message me back in January, put that straight in your calendar as a reminder and then click that on your podcasting grid that you've gotten that response. So you don't, if you've said that, the worst thing you can do is follow up again in two days when you've just told someone to come right. back in January because they haven't listened to you. They're not paying attention. But also the other thing is if someone's given you that opportunity, to me, that's a yes, not now. Come back. So I will write that in my calendar and I will come back in January because right. then you then I've paid attention. I've done the action that you've said. I haven't dropped the opportunity and you're right. People sending one pitch will not get you booked every single time. There's no way in the world you have to follow up. So Sherry, what is the window between that you prefer as individual for if I sent you a pitch, what is the ideal time between me following up with you? A week. A week. Okay. It's different yeah. for every host. So, but that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. I'm like, give me a week because if I have not answered you, if you're emailing me on a Monday, I don't have, I certainly do not want to get into anything but on Friday, you know, follow up again with me on the same day, the following week. And that way, you know, that it has been a week and I, I do not let an email go past a follow up. I mean, to me, no one is that busy that you cannot sit down and answer your emails, especially if someone is emailing you for the second time as a follow-up. If by the time you follow up, if you're still not getting a response, I would push it down to maybe two or three weeks. If you're still not getting a response, you, you don't feel that that person is putting any value in you, move on. Because I'm just not going to, and I don't, this may sound bitchy, I don't know, but I am not going to put that much effort into pitching myself to someone multiple, multiple times. I am, I am going to pitch you. If I don't hear back, I'm going to follow up. And if I don't hear back, I'm going to wait probably about three or four weeks. If I don't hear back from you, we are not vibing because to me, it's just downright disrespectful and it's not good business practice and we're not like-minded. So I really want to mesh with people that are like-minded like I am. And as an agent, we pitch thousands of people and book thousands of shows and we get lots of no's. And a no is as good as a yes to me because it means, okay, great, move on. 
So get, just right. getting the answer is as good because you're not a fit for every show, but also don't pitch a show if you're not a great fit for them. If, if their guests were Oprah and Tim Ferriss and they're all triple A list, you're probably not a right fit for the show and you pitching them is going to actually position you unprofessionally because it shows that you don't understand the caliber of the show. You need right. to, you know, the old saying, crawl before you can walk and go on smaller shows and get your messaging and interview technique right because it is practice. There are so many, it's like walking, talking, chewing gum all at the same time, skipping on one foot. So there is the element of getting practice and you'll become better and better and better and better. And by the time you go to that dream show that you want, you might've put in 50 to hundred shows and you are an expert. So on your online media kit, you can be like, I've been on this show, this show, this show, and you can listen to those. And right. then because any producer worth their weight, when they get pitched, the pitch, it doesn't seal the deal. That's just a, oh, yes, I'll look into that more. And then every single producer and host has their own vetting process. They'll be like, okay, yeah, I am interested in having Kelly as a guest. Let me look at her website. Let me look at her social media. Let me look at other shows she's been on. What are her talking points? They will go through like 20 things before they even think, okay, yeah, we might have her on and schedule her. So there's, right. you have to have all those ducks in a row. Um, so it's all about your personal branding and messaging as well as an, as an author. So right. a great way to pull out those topics is well, what are your chapter headings? That's a great one um, because people are often experts in their field, not just authors, and they don't know what to talk about. So you have to package yourself up for the press. And this is not just podcasting. This is also TV. This is radio. This is magazines, right. this is online. This is all, everything that I'm saying is pretty much transferable to every type of media possible. Um, so, and since media has become DIY on, you know, podcast, YouTube, all these different things, and lots of people are DIY pitching themselves, I think it's time to up that to a professional level. I, I think so too, because I think when you're starting out, yeah, I, I totally believe that if you are comfortable in doing your thing, but if you're not getting the results that you're wanting, then I am a true believer in coaching. And I think that you should step it up to someone that knows the business and invest in yourself because the number one thing that you should do with your money is invest in yourself. I've preached that a thousand times that you have to invest in yourself, just like you invest in your business, whatever, whatever you have going on, you are only going to be at a higher level that you will allow yourself to be at. So if I want to be in a higher level, Hey, you know what? I, I could go to Kelly right now and say, listen, I want to be on Good Morning America. Who do you know? I need to pitch. What do we need to do? I want to have my own show. I want to start my own local television show. I can go to Kelly. Hey, help me out. What do I do? How do I pitch this to a network? How do I do these things? And there's always somebody out there that has the experience like you do to help someone reach that, that next level. And I love that. I really do. But you've also got to go to someone that will trust you and say, you're not ready for that yet. Correct. Do you know what I'm like? So, um, or because people like PR people like me and I've been a talent agent as well and I've worked in reality TV. I forgot to tell you that, Sherry. Like, oh, a reality TV casting. I was just at the office. I love my reality TV guest. Love it. Yeah. Them. Just here in LA. Um, I, I, actually, I probably can speak about it now. The, the Jenna Lyons show is, um, she used to be on Project Runway and yeah. she um, is, was the president of J Crew for a long time. She's doing a show. So that's in the casting stages right now. So I was help casting the first series and then I've um, been there in the yesterday getting the rest of the, yeah. So it's pretty interesting. I should talk about it. Fun. You know, that, but that's Fun. a separate thing. But, but it all plays into it because it's right. all about like casting and agenting and pitching. It's all, it's a 360 degree of the same thing, right? Right. Um, but I think, and also this plays into what you said that you learn all the podcasting things yourself in a really long way. Sometimes you just need to go to someone in one spot and find out all the things. So for online courses, um, yeah, Amy Porterfield, you know what? I'm willing to pay her because she's got it and I follow it step by step. So whoever that person is in your field, in the thing that you want to do, you're going to accelerate your learning by doing it that way. Instead of taking two years, you can buy the course and go through it module by module. Right. And same with your writing course, same right. with, same with um, Talent Squad Academy. In, and I've, for us, we've put it in separate modules because we appreciate some people are at different points. So you may only need help with the pitching and you already might have your messaging. You may already be on shows, but we want to get your interview training right. So 
make sure you do the course or program or even self-directed learning where you are. Right. Because I've done so many courses where I've done the whole thing and I'm like, you know what? I probably could have gone in halfway because I actually need that stuff. It's a right. <laughs> and then I think, I, and then I'm angry at myself. I'm like, I've wasted all that time and I should have trusted that I knew that thing um, instead of thinking that I didn't. So we're, everyone's on their own journey. It is. And, I, and, and to back to the podcasting, I love, one thing that I really love about the podcasting now is that your talents, your skills, whether it be a product or a service, whatever you want to get out to the world, if you are on a podcast show and you are coming across as someone that serves, not selling, come across as a servant of that individual that needs something from you, whether it be a service or a product or whatever it may be, then podcasting is such an amazing stepping stone. Like it can be your first stepping stone in getting the word out there. And then it just grows and grows and grows from that. Because if you think about the way that you interact online these days, and I've done this myself and I'm sure you have, Sherry, you see someone on a podcast, then you see their blog post, and then the Facebook ads target you, and then the Instagram ads target you, and then you see them, see them, touch point, touch point, touch point, and then you might read some of their stuff, do the thing, do the thing, and it might be a year, and then you'll go and buy that Amy Porterfield course for $1,200. Right. So it's not about going on a podcast and the next day you're going to have millions of book sales. It doesn't work that way. It's getting them into your, well, you know, the word is funnel, right, or ecosystem, right. and then spending some time with you. And it's like the marriage dating. You're getting on the first date. Yes, I like them. Then you've got all these other dates and then it'll be the wedding, which is the purchase. So think about it that way instead of thinking about it going on show equals book sales the next day because that's not how it works. No, it's and not. Depend, depending on what your expertise is, and I know people use books as business cards these days or as a proof of their expertise, it's not about the eight ninety nine book. It's about the client that's $20,000 that is – is much more, how many books would you have to sell to get that amount of money? Right. But maybe it's that client. So maybe it's not actually about the book anyway. Right. Maybe right. it is, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. And, and it's one thing that I talk about even in writing a book is that, yes, it does. It brings you credibility. And it took me after I had a publisher that took my book and promised me the moon and I did not get that. And so I took my book back, changed my book cover and I studied so hard for a year to figure out how to publish this book. I thought no one should have to go through this torture. So I did. I put it together in a very easy online course, Writer's Roadmap, which, you know, little plug, it launches in a couple of weeks. It only launches three times a year. But I did that just like you do. You take all of this knowledge and this, all of this experience and then you take it instead of someone having to research forever how to do something that they want to do you put it, you condense it down to a program and show them this is what you need to do. No matter what it is, whether it's pitching or, you know, coming up with, you know, how to be on particular podcasts or radio shows, you can do that for them. And then also with books and courses, like if we all, I think the best ways for us, for us to all think about what we do when it comes to other people, because we're all pretty typical right now, like I told you, I'm in LA, came from New York, heading to Atlanta. And I've got about 10 books with me that I've told myself I'm going to read. And I've purchased those books. These are hardcover books. They're sitting in the suitcase. And I, I read some of it on the plane yesterday, but I haven't read it. But if I buy an online course, I'm probably going to do some of it. Like I'm pretty good. I usually do all of it. Right. But some of it, or if I've got a podcast, I'm going to listen to it, listen to the whole thing. So um, people sometimes buy the book to support the people because they like the idea, but they consume content in other ways. Right. So... Or they might get the online book but, um, or the Kindle, but how much of it do you actually read? So exactly. the consumption of other products sometimes I think is higher than the consumption of books. But the book is a thing that's like, yeah, they've written a whole book about it. They know all the stuff. I've flipped through it. I trust you. And now I'm going to do the other thing. Oh, Kelly, I can talk to you all day. <laughs> you are so Me? like, I'm just sitting here like I, I could think of a thousand questions and then I look at the time and I'm like, I can't keep her any longer because yeah. we could well, just go on and on. But what I'm I, saying isn't always popular. Well, Sherry, what I'm saying is not always popular and people will promise you the moon and say, go on the podcast, you'll have a million sales the next day, do blah, 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 blah. But that's not how it works and you're going to be disappointed. And I'd rather people go in with a realistic view and then have it actually work in the longer term than go in with a short-term view and be like, well, I didn't get this and this is what they said and that's not true. 
Right. And you know what? And, I and, I, and, and it's funny that you said that because I know one thing when I told a particular person, I said, you know, I'm going to turn Real Girl Talk, my Facebook Live into Real Girl Talk, my podcast show. And her immediate response was, well, how are you going to make money from that? And I thought, well, I didn't make any money from Facebook Live and I absolutely loved it. But yeah, you can monetize your podcast, but that's not why I was going into it. So it kind of set me back when she said it because I thought that wasn't my initial feeling. <laughs> that wasn't my yeah. goal when I started podcasting. But yeah, you can make lots of money, but you have to have the downloads. You have to have the credibility in order to be able to advertise. And I am just now to that point and November 1st will just be a year and I am just now have enough downloads to really start taking the interest of advertisers. So it takes time. But I'm going to shift that mindset for a second, Sherry, because I'm going to say it's not about the downloads because how much is your course? How much is your book? How much is your retreat? How much are all the other things? And right. what is the revenue from that? When you think about downloads, a CPM is $25 per thousand listens, how many listeners do you need to get to make even just a thousand dollars? A lot, but you sell one course, that's a, it's worth way more. So it's not about the, the, the value of somebody listening to your show is not correlated to a $25 CPM. Right. To all the other things. So I think when people think, and it's because it's a new medium and we've been taught to think this way. It, the, the, the thought is show equals downloads equals advertiser money. I would say think of that differently and think about the income from the other revenue streams and not the actual downloads. It's the action of the listener instead of the actual money to download. Right. A hundred percent. I, and I didn't understand that. And I'm saying a hundred percent and I agree with you now because going into this, I didn't know anything. Do you hear me? People anything. don't know what they don't. This is getting discovered all the time. Right. It's getting discovered all the time and it's moving so quickly. And even in the last six months, and it, it's not that people are stupid or they're thinking the wrong way or they're pigheaded or anything like that. It's you don't know what you don't know and you don't know the results until you go through it and go through it and go through it. And then you're like, oh, actually, I sold this amount of courses or even I had this person on my show and this relationship, like you just told me you're getting flown somewhere for some awesome event. Right. As a, that's a result of the podcast. Well, if that, if you, if you were measuring your success by that one person listening and you're getting two cents from it, but, but that is not the same result as getting flown somewhere to be part of this awesome media junket with your daughter and doing this amazing content right like where's where's the actual result there right and, and you're and I'm, that's so cool that you said that because yeah I mean Monique Samuels is amazing I love her she is a housewife of Potomac on Bravo TV her agent reached out to me I did not seek her her agent reached out to me he said I love your show you had one of my other um clients on your show I'd love for you to have Monique I had Monique on the show Monique and I actually we vibed we connected we made a friendship. She asked me to be on her show, Not For Lazy Moms. I just did an amazing episode. It was episode 14 towards the end of her season for that show. And she invited my daughter and I to be her VIP guest at Not For Lazy Moms Podcast Live in DC, which we're flying out next weekend. So the way that that progressed was just a simple email introduction from her agent. And now I'm flying to DC to party with her. So <laughs> yeah. now $25, if you could earn a $25 for a thousand people listening or you've got that Monique situation. Right, which, right. What do you prefer and what is more beneficial? Right. No, I'm going to see Monique and Chris all the way. I think it's just shifting our mind that changes, that changes things. People are like, oh, I need to get on Tim Ferriss and I'm not, I'm a failure. Oh, uh, I need to have a million downloads and I need to earn all these dollars from having millions of people listening. No, you need one Monique listening and then that, and, and you are a success. Right. I'm going to put Tim Ferriss on my vision board, by the way. Oh my gosh. Have you not listened to a single thing that I've said? <laughs> I love you, Sherry. Yeah, you see, I love but, you. Yeah, but here, see, here's the thing. I am one of those people that if you tell me that I can't do something, I am going to spend the next month trying to prove to you that I can. And then I will spend the next month making sure I can so I can go back and show you that I did. <laughs> I reckon Tim Ferriss and like I read the four hour work week when it came out years ago and I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like it's a nice idea, but who's going to do that? No one. Having no idea that I would one day run a business that's remote, remote 
Um, <laughs> and then I, one day I went, oh my God, I'm actually living the four hour work week. Wow. That's amazing. Um, but whenever I contact Tim Ferriss's assistant to pitch people to him, I reckon 50% of the time the responsive Tim is on hiatus at the moment. I reckon that man lives on hiatus. I reckon he is on right. hiatus. Like, you know, most of the time, <laughs> 364 days of the year. He seems to be living the best life. Yes. I think, well, I really would like to live Tony Robbins life and I would like to own an Island somewhere where when I'm on hiatus, I can go and fly out to my private Island, which he owns and just live there for a while. Yeah. I've, I've got a client who bought an Island in Panama, Panama. I'll put you in touch. Yes. Thank you. That's good. See, I knew this connection was going to take me places. This is great. <laughs> Kelly, I love you so much. I love you, girl. Tell everybody where we can find you and how they can work with you so you can help them as well. Get on podcast, start their podcast. Where can we find you? Okay. Tal the talent squad.com. If you want me to book you, that's awesome. If you don't have the budget, then I highly suggest talentsquadacademy.com and that's where you can learn to do it yourself, which you absolutely can. So either do it yourself, get a VA or get someone from your team to do it. My only thing is make sure they're trained and know what they're doing so your brand is being portrayed in the absolute best way possible. If you already know everything I've said, go nuts and tell me about these awesome interviews because I would love to hear the interviews that you are doing on whatever shows you get on. Awesome. And where can we find you on social media? Um, the best place is Instagram at the talent squad one. Talent, you, the, the talent squad one. Okay. Yeah. So everybody's going to follow you. And guys, if yeah, you, everybody. if, if you received a golden nugget from this episode with Kelly and I, Take a screenshot on your phone because I know that's how you're listening to it and make sure that you're tagging Kelly and make sure you're tagging me so we know that you listen to it. And if you have just a few minutes or just a second, it only takes 15 seconds, I think. Go down to iTunes, leave me a review, let me know how this episode has helped you or any of the other episodes, past episodes of Real Girl Talk. I appreciate you so much. And until next week, I want you to please. Keep your encouragement tank full, whatever you need to do to keep yourself lifted, keep your faith in God and have a blessed, blessed week.